today uh, on this session of ulp we have our very own uh, friend uh, now and he was also uh, one of our previous guests at ulp so none other than rajarshi nandi and uh, we are very happy to have him today welcome rajarshi uh rajarshi is already uh, very well known to most of you but for those who are for the first time tuning into the session of ulp uh rajarshi is a sadhak and he's adherent of the sanatan dharma by training he's a technical writer and a spiritualist by passion he does not belong or subscribe to a particular sect of hinduism he is open to the idea of exploring them all he is a sadhak par excellence and a guide to many on the spiritual plane and today uh, it's also very special because he is joining us all the way from kamakha the shakti peet and we are very happy to have him today so we welcome him again rajushri welcome to you and namaste to everybody Thank you very, very, very special day for us and uh, <laughs> a brand new year and a brand new series. So welcome, Rajeshi, <laughs> and thank you for joining us all the way from Kamakha today. So <laughs> I take it as a very special session, <laughs> given the location <laughs> where you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> given the location where you are, and so let's start. So the reason for this session is is this that there is a lot of unrest in the world, a lot of unrest <laughs> right now as we speak, and uh, the. call to go in for every single person has is is coming in different ways people are feeling mm-hmm. this unrest they want to do something about it mm-hmm. um and today i want you to adopt the role of that of a guide given your extensive experience <laughs> in in the field of sadhana as a, as a sadhak as a writer um and share with us like what would be your message to those that are feeling this unrest from the core and nothing is satisfying them in terms of materials on the outside mm-hmm. uh okay hello everybody <laughs> uh so it is not only about what is going on right now but in general uh, i believe that it's a extremely good idea to have a uh, set kind of spiritual practice and that could be anything for that matter uh, and uh, as with all things in life so it is not going to bear fruits on day one so it is so if somebody were to suddenly turn spiritual and do some practice right now you know who hasn't done anything so don't expect any miraculous results uh, immediately but uh, the good part of it is if if it is made into a you know a, a process that is done along with everything else that you do in life then in times of crisis times of unrest times of other difficulties you will have something to fall back on and uh, it it is not about that there will be something miraculous that will happen i mean it may happen uh, of course but uh, but that's not the primary objective of this the primary objective is that when things are completely going outside of plan things are completely not in control that is where you have some space where you can get back and settle down and feel at ease even though there may be all sorts of disturbances around you if you reach that kind of a zone in your practice that itself is a mark of an advanced uh, person to be uh, you know as a first level and um, it doesn't matter what practice somebody believes in i mean i my path is related to tantra sadhana uh, there may be somebody else doing something that's fine uh, similar kind of uh, uh, a detached view of life where you are both at the same time engaged in things yet not too involved but involved enough to enjoy things and it's very difficult to define it in words actually it's there's this thin line you don't go too far from that it's that central line you figure out in your practice and you know that everything is possible so long as you are on that line you don't deviate too much to the left not to the right on that central position uh, if that's how you carry on then uh, you'll have a it doesn't matter whether there's a world war going on it doesn't matter if there's a volcano it doesn't matter if there is an earthquake it doesn't matter uh, various things uh, life goes on some days it will be good some days it will be bad but you have your center and you can fall back on that and that is the space of uh, for lack of you know better words the condition of sukha of of internal happiness is there so that is kind of a very primary aspect of any spiritual practice so i think uh, Uh, today or you know any time anybody starts that that should be a goal to 
attain. Achieve, yeah. The, the space of neutrality where you can see you're yeah. not going too right or too mm-hmm. left in, mm-hmm. in that space. Right. So, uh, and, and, and that, so you said that this, whichever path you follow, and we touched upon this in your, you know, when you were our guest in one of our previous sessions right. about the, the uh, role of a guru, the role of a teacher, you know, whether in a physical right. body and, and also in a non physical entity yeah. in the astral plane, mm-hmm. you know, if you have a mm-hmm. teacher, what role that uh, does that play? Now, mm-hmm. given the world that we are in we have billions of um, you know path ways you know to to find and different mm-hmm. kinds of meditation apps and you have meditation tools you have mm-hmm. all these right. kind of things going on so would you suggest would you say that people should try and see which one works for them or how does one really start say for example someone wants to really start working on this or, or you know get on a path so what would be your um, idea to how how does one start uh, so it depends first of all uh, while all paths lead to broadly similar goals but there are each path has its own nuances its own demands its own procedures etc mm-hmm. some practices which can work out through for example say simple meditative practices other things so you may read it from a book or you may find some you know app or something like that uh, and you can try and uh, that will work out uh, whereas there are certain other practices that are more dependent on rituals for example the path of tantra sadhana tantra sadhana requires a certain degree of proficiency in rituals um, it is like um, this aspect where the rituals come into play and how one benefits from them. So there is a space in this where it is very difficult to get it without uh, uh, somebody sort of hand-holding you, a physical guru. It's very important. That's, the, uh, that's what I'm getting at. So uh, this is these practices, there is no doubt about it that the guru is required. Whether the guru is... Uh, whether uh, it's a sadguru or whether sadguru in the sense of somebody who's ultimately you know self-realized to the power of infinity and whatever else etc doesn't matter but you need somebody to guide you the technicality of the upasana that is very difficult to get just by reading a book or uh, you know some other means now here i would like to point out that it is extremely possible for people to get guided astrally by other beings etc uh, spiritual guidance is possible but mark my words, there's a difference I'm speaking about. So, A, there is spiritual guidance. B, in Tantra Sadhana, there is both spiritual guidance as well as the technicality involved in the path. Okay? How exactly do I sit? Where exactly do I place this flower? How, what yantra do I make when I'm sitting in an asana? Okay, how do I place the water there? What nyasa I have to do? These things will never come to you from books, never come to you from any astral things. You will need somebody to physically show you these things. Now, it's why do we need these things? That's because this is the kind of spirituality, it's like if a class, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a kid uh, is going to school and he's being taught that these are the multiplication tables. So he is like clueless. Why do I need to learn this? It's only after you pass, you, you go up a bit and you go out and you need to buy something from the store. Then you realize, oh, I need the addition, I need the numbers, I need this, I need that, etc. Tantra is designed that way. So there are certain things you will need somebody to physically teach you these things. And that's where the role of a living guru becomes important. Then you keep practicing. Just because you know that doesn't mean that you already, you know, have achieved some spiritual greatness. No. But with that base, with that foundation, when you keep your practice going on for years, then a realization will come to you that there's a certain degree of synchronicity, a certain resonance between the ritual that you're doing externally and certain states that it's created internally. And this is a art that has been perfected for over more than 2000 years in this land so there is no way anybody can be able to bypass this and still reach those states in its full manifestation it's almost impossible so you will need somewhere you need a guidance of a living human being this is where the importance comes in but that is not a guarantee that by itself you will become spiritual so that there's a lot of other factors how much involved you are in the practice what is the caliber of the individual who is practicing so various things are there so I believe some practices can be done uh, anyway uh, by an individual. Uh, say, if, I, if I'm speaking from the point of view of uh, Upasana of Devatas, which is one of the primary things in Hindu Dharma, and uh, so if I have to worship a deity. So there are mantras which relate to the deity. Okay, Mantra Sadhana, the path of Mantra Marga, Tantra intricately linked. 
but we also hear from the texts that tell you that not all mantras can be chanted without an initiation uh, which is a diksha or an upadesha which is an advice from somebody who is like a guru why that is because it's possible that some mantras may react in a certain manner to an individual so we need to preempt the chances of a negative fallout so that is why we need to you know understand okay this is the nature of the individual so maybe this kind of mantra will work this will not work etc but uh, there are certain basic practices for example the uh, the ashtottara nama of the devas ashtottara nama means hundred names of a deity you don't need anybody's permission to do that you don't need a guru to do that if there's a deity with whom you can chill overall uh, by that i mean that suppose somebody is very scared of kali but it decides to do kali ashtottara that is stupid okay so you need to have this basic understanding here so basic understanding is it the deity that i like i i i can you know relate to that form that iconography that basic energy the attributes of the deity uh, in that case you might as well pick up the 108 names and keep chanting you don't need anybody's permission to do that those are free it is only when you add a mantra or a bija mantra or something like that then you will need an advice from a guru whether this is you know should i do this or not this etc so there is a space where people without any guide or a guru at that point you know at a given point may start of some practices you can start meditation you can start in ashtakura nama for devata things like that simpler ones and then if it is meant if you are serious about it your practices goes deeper your practice you know um it works this way the deity itself whom you are worshiping he or she is going to send you the right people to guide you you don't have to go run around anywhere and this is something i've seen many times so yes there is the necessity of a guru absolutely i and then i do at the same time it should not be that you know because i don't have a guru so okay i'm not going to do anything okay then so it is like a defeatist attitude you take those practices which does not require a guru as start up and then nature will do the rest if you are good enough if you if you're sincere in your practice so that's how i look at it yeah that's a, that's a brilliant point you raised about the technicality because sometimes even the the power of the mantra or the power of the you know ritual itself it's so powerful yeah, yeah. but but most people yeah. don't know like even if you go to a normal temple like you know a, a yeah. local temple yeah. say in india yeah. or yeah. delhi for example you have these yeah. priests doing the the pujo and then yeah. you see the way they are chanting it's it's yeah. there's a sound sort of sound but it is not the right yeah. kind of sound the energy is yeah. not there and yeah. you feel that if you do it right if you do it technically correctly there is so much of power in this um now coming to the technicalities of tantra sadhana which is something that you like and you have been practicing <laughs> for years now um so tantra is the, it's more mathematical in a way it's very patterned you know you have you know yeah. that these yeah. this is how it this is if this is what you do this is what the result is going to be it's set in stone yeah. and you have to follow it as as it is you can't yeah. deviate from it now how much of a guidance in terms of guru as in one person like one individual guru or has there been like a progression of teachers you have had in your tantra sadhana and if you were to guide people further on to take on this yeah. path would you say that yeah. there will be a progression of gurus that they would see as they you know as they move on in their journey how does it work okay so if i understand this correctly let's break down the question to two parts first is that about my gurus i will not go into details except that i have at least uh, two different uh, gurus from whom i have learned and i am always open to learning from in the future if i find somebody who has a certain vidya that i'm curious to know uh, and the person is uh, kind enough to share uh said to teach i am open to becoming a disciple and learn so i do not have this set fixed in my mind okay ki, okay one guru there is no more uh, or it works for some some people it's fine one guru is fine for me i have two conceptions of the guru in this matter uh, a physical human guru is very important as i told you in terms of that because you will not know the technicalities yeah. whether it, but here is the catch we live in an age but even the best of men the greatest of men still have some aspects that are human and therefore they will make mistakes and this is to be expected this is going to happen to me you everybody there is no no bypassing this so many people have you know when they read biographies of saints and things like that which are all true but also perhaps a little hyperbolized in the way it is presented so have this fantastic idea that only you know somebody from the clouds will 
come down and give you some initiation oh i am waiting like this this is this very teenage romantic story kind of thing it doesn't work that way every single guru is great even the greatest gurus those who are siddha gurus okay they are fantastic they are amazing but still if they have a human body they will have such human tendencies and somewhere or the other they will end up making some mistake or the other the devadas don't make mistakes but humans will make some mistakes or the other in this age maybe in perhaps a previous era there were great issues who were flawless but today we don't have that luxury so this caveat out of the way i believe there is two aspects to the question of how one should approach the guru one is that a there is a physical presence of a guru that is very important b if you can make a deity into a guru and that is very very tough mind you that is a different matter altogether then it is it's not a different impossible. ball game it's a different yeah, ball game altogether it yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah 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 it changes everything but it is mind you it is it is difficult and the kind of tests you will be put through because a deity is not human so he or she when he decides to take charge of your life and teach you uh you are going to be put to the grind uh, so human gurus there's a there's a human aspect to gurus even if the toughest of gurus so you make a mistake you fall down the feet oh mera galti ho gaya kuch kar do ye wo etc something okay they may allow you some leave deities don't work that way if they take hold of us they will not come to you in the first place they do just new if you are good enough to make them interested in you suppose one of them decides okay chalo i will guide you they their objectivity is tremendous i mean they they uh, they never their judgment never gets clouded if you are able to approach a deity and the deity sort of you know decides to guide you then that is uh, they don't suffer from as i was saying uh, they have compassion but they don't suffer from pity pity is a human condition a sentimentality okay pity is something like you take pity on somebody means you act with the faith that you are doing something good for the person without having sufficient knowledge of what is good and what is bad that is what pity is compassion on the other hand is that uh, you may have a complete knowledge of things and uh, when a doctor is operating on you or something like that if not um, the disease may spread somewhere else so that is actually an act of compassion it may for the short term appear to be cruel uh, but going ahead this is something that will benefit the person so deities can work that way so they may not always do things that you want them uh, they will definitely not do that they will do what they think is good for you and that may include yeah even putting you through very rough patches but if somebody is able to hang on to that and uh, it takes years of dedication i mean you, you single point of dedication is required then there is possibility that the individual that will become an exception to us and i have interacted with few it's not easy it's rare most people find it more comforting to have a physical guru so you know every second day you can go and say guru ji yes sir yeah sir yeah guru ji also will say yeah but yeah sir but uh, having a date is not that simple as it is if you have it then uh, you will be well prepared it is the role of the deity they know how to prepare somebody and they will do whatever it takes okay they and if whatever it takes to create an individual into a higher caliber of person that they can do there's no doubt about it uh the third point that i would like to make is that whether there should be one guru or multiple guru we have examples of both historically so it is not like you need only one guru and that is fixed some people it works that way i mean i know a very fantastic uh, tantra master mm-hmm. who uh, uh, who has who belongs to a sampradaya he is a sadguru Yeah, and Sadhguru was fantastic. Um, before he reached the Sadhguru, he had gone through close to almost hundred different individuals across India, searching for who is the right one, who is the right one, sort of. Okay, like that. Uh, so, and after he found the Sadhguru, there was no need to, you know, search for anybody. I mean, he's, he's very advanced. Then again, there are examples of people uh, who has had multiple gurus, and there is nothing wrong in that, in the sense that there uh, some. individual may have a proficiency in certain kind of vidya and other individual may know some other vidya very well so if it is your destiny that you need to know this as well as that so you may have to have more than one guru so that's perfectly all right in my opinion that makes sense so um, now tell me that 
every body mm. like uh, we are born in this we have this physical body with us so uh, every mm. body is different and the structure is different and as time goes you know we treat it to different things and different kinds yeah. of exposures so when it mm. comes to a sadhana like as mathematical and as you know rigorous and as precise as tantra or any yeah. other school Let, let's talk about tantra now um mm. how capable you know so every since every body is different and the exposures have been different how mm. capable is every single body to carry out the tantra sadhana or is it also dependent on you know whether you start but you can't continue and you know there is going to be something so how much of it is it dependent on the body that you have ha huh. so so uh, if i understand the question correctly so uh, first thing is that the physical body that you get is a result of the purva samskaras okay the things that of individual jiva might have done in past lives and uh, samskaras means not necessarily something negative they could be just means tendencies so it's possible that in past life you need a, somebody had a tendency for tantra vasana so he gets a physical body uh, he takes birth he or she takes birth in a physical body that is more appropriate for tantra sadhana and then he or she may be even born in an environment where it is easier to practice tantra sadhana uh, is tantra a path for everybody no definitely not but on the other hand uh, so this judgment that who is fit to practice this path who is not fit to practice this path either a person has his own inclination and understanding you know uh, that uh, so you can decide based on that okay I, uh, this this is the path that seems suitable for me uh, or you have a guru or somebody more mature enough uh, uh, advanced to pass it maybe you can say that okay this you know given your tendencies uh, tantra sadhana may be a uh, suitable path now there is one thing that needs to be understood in when i say tantra sadhana it's definitely technical it's definitely very rigorous no doubt but beyond the technicality there is another aspect to it so to give a simple example and i have given this example many times suppose you have a gun uh, in order to fire the gun you will need bullets into the you know add bullets so gun and the bullet together becomes a deadly combination if you don't have the bullet and if you have only the gun it is useless okay so the gun is like the ritual okay you will need the ritual definitely without the ritual you cannot progress but the bullet is the shakti that you have generated through your practice so there are two components that come together to perfect this other you may know all the rituals in the world but if your shakti is very low which which means basically you have the gun but you don't have the bullet so you won't be able to fire anything on the other hand suppose you have done a lot of practices you have developed your own shakti the organic way you have done it not in a methodical way but you don't know the rituals so here the situation is you have a whole lot of bullets but you don't have a gun so you have to just throw it with your hand and see if it sticks somewhere <laughs> so ye bhi nahi kaam karega <laughs> so yeah, this is how a, that's this a, yeah that's a good example yeah and i'm coming i'm coming to this part of shakti because it's interesting that how much hmm. so what is the balance of shakti and bhakti like you know if you if you take bhakti and shakti together so what is the hmm. balance that you need for tantra sadhana both are needed definitely but the term bhakti see all tantra sadhaks that have went the good ones are extreme they are great devotees also bhakti is very strongly there on the devata there is a difference in the bhakti uh between the vaishnava bhakti and the shakta bhakti shakta is where uh, devotion to the divine mother shakti okay difference is that in the vaishnava system if you see at least uh, i am not talking of theology and all that i'm just talking of simple observation if you go to a vaishnava sampradaya and if you you know take part in that you will see that you are not only devoted you have your bhakti not only to uh, vishnu but you also have your bhakti to the devotees of vishnu this is very important so you have to make yourself humble to the level of like a you know like a like a very faint small insignificant piece of grass uh, who looks at the world with wonder and creation of vishnu and you feel that devotional uh, attitude of service broadly there are the devotional aspects also but this is the general vaishnava tendency towards bhakti is that you become like a servant of the god servant of the servant of the devata in the shakta system we don't do that our devotion is very much to the divine mother but only to her to her to the guru the rest of the world you 
behave in the way that you are meant to behave. There's no, you know, oh, because uh, somebody is watching <laughs> the mother, how many jackets to wear? Forget it. That's not enough. So, single-pointed allegiance to the divine mother is very, very, very important. Whoever is your ishta devata, bhakti is extremely. In fact, uh, this is the biggest secret. The greatest of tantric masters know this. That uh, at the highest level, there is absolutely no difference between. Your tantra, your bhakti, and your shakti—all three become merged together. And when we say bhakti, we assume that it is very easy. On the contrary, bhakti is far more difficult. Very hard, than yeah, yeah. Uh, very hard. <laughs> than okay. everything. It's more difficult than actually. Shakti, it's more difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it is your the the quality of a bhakti changes with the quality of a shakti. Let's put it this way: the more shakti you have, the greater amount of bhakti you will be capable of having. And uh, Bhakti is not merely an, you know, on the on the a thing on the surface that oh, I am devoted to X Y Z. I feel very good, so every time I see somebody, I just take the name of the deity a few times a day, and this and that. It's much more deeper. It's like you are ready to sacrifice everything for the deity. You are ready to sacrifice everything for the goddess, and that is the kind of feeling you have inside. That is the kind of bhakti you have inside. Then your shakti will automatically increase. There is an intricate link between shakti and bhakti. There is an intricate link, and again, uh, very interestingly, uh, this reminds me. I had uh, the good fortune of interacting with a siddha upasa last year. He um, was very, very advanced, and he made this so uh, interesting a comment. He said that the world is filled with people who appear uh, when they interact with the world outside upasa. Uh, uh, they appear as great bhaktas. They are great devotees, but when they interact with their deity, they appear as great sadhaks. There are no bigger fools than that. Basically, to the world you appear as a sadhak. You, I am a very great person. I can do. It doesn't matter. To your deity, you have to appear only as a bhakta. In front of the deity, there is no other equation you can have. You are not a sadhak. It doesn't matter. I have read ten books and I know three PhDs in Sanskrit and I have X Y Z. Kuch farak nahi bata. Sab theek ho. In front of the deity, you are just a devotee. The, the, the beauty of this is that not only you have to be devoted, you have to be completely honest. The kind of honesty that you must have with the deity is beyond everything. All the good, all the bad has to be told to the deity, because nobody, and least of all the gods, like somebody who's who's uh, trying to be smart, who's trying to you know uh, that if you give up the vibe that okay, okay, I know very, I know a lot, and I can handle everything. But he can. मैनिफेस्टेशन डिफाइन मदर But if we are not at that stage, which is the case with ninety nine point nine percent of us, there is no point pretending that. That is foolishness and delusion. So you deal with the world in the way it is to be rationally dealt with. But internally, your devotion is entirely to the feet of the mother. That is the primary concept of bhakti in tantra upasana and the tantric part. And yes, bhakti is very important because there I have never seen a single high caliber upasana who does not have bhakti. And I am talking about tantra. Tantra Vasa, not Vishnu, or not Shiva, or not anything else. Okay, a single-pointed allegiance to the mother, single-pointed allegiance to the form of the mother. That is very important. So, in 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 the tantra sadhana that you do, and uh, so how important mm-hmm. one is like your relationship with the deity, and you know, and the and the, and the sadhana itself. How important is it the sangat, the the group that you know of of sadhaks? Uh, what role mm-hmm. does it play? And is, is is it like everybody has to have a group, or they they find the group eventually as they progress on the path, or is it that you can just be a tantra sadhak in an isolated place, all on your own? uh that depends actually in thing i think in initial stages it is good to have at least a few people of like minded people uh, because you will always because your uh, state is not so high that you can be in a uh, continuous state of sadhana okay all the time so other times what are you going to do you will see a movie you will go out do whatever else you like goes on in that period if you have a group of people who are also purely dedicated to the same uh, path that you are you can discuss things uh it helps you it makes keeps you motivated 
so that is there is definitely an advantage to that but yes in very high states when you reach as you keep going state after state after state as you go so you will not find company it's not like then to then it is it is not um, it's not loneliness there is no loneliness but you will be alone at the highest stages of sadhana there is no group very rare instances it is possible maybe one individual may walk along with you but that again is said by the devata the deity will decide if at all an individual can walk how far he or she can walk with you and in also rare instances there may be a couple sometimes it happens who are of similar caliber and similar depth and they have reached mind you this is very rare and it's very easy to assume uh, and many people these days assume that okay uh, you know if you are married or if you have a partner or something like that so both of us are doing sadhana but go very very rarely at the higher stages uh, both of their capacities and calibers are of the same order at higher stages lower stages it doesn't matter everybody is in the same order state okay higher stages if at all there is a perfect sync and if at all they have gone to a very high state then uh, it can be a to be a very powerful experience very powerful experience but more or less the standard format that i have seen is that as you keep going higher you will get more uh again alone not lonely not, lonely yeah, gives the vibe that lonely, yeah lonely is more uh, like you, you know i'm know. lost I, i don't have anybody <laughs> around yes, i'm just yes, so yes. alone yes It's please send me a friend request kind of not that lonely <laughs> so you will have to be you will be in a alone state and that's usme maza hai hmm? yeah right. that's that's beautiful and then uh, in in tan in tantra like um, if someone has to start like you know it the process uh, anyway anything to master anything it takes years and it's like you know lifetimes after lifetimes and you never really know you know how many lifetimes you have so if you start if you start and people give up midway for the sheer reason is like i don't have any results you know i can't see what is happening i still and and what i have found or what i have seen is that the more rigorously you do a practice the more you're thrown off balance in your materialistic agreed upon 3d reality um, and that and that itself that shift itself is something that people don't want to take it's like i don't want to see i was happy you know it's just this this thing is like it's keeping me away mm-hmm. so what are you, what would you suggest to those people who just give up and uh, you know just because of the sheer lack of or, or maybe they want to control and can't control what would you say uh see this is uh, uh, it's very difficult to give a clear advice on this because for a lot of people and this is not just in the path of tantra sadhana i mean for all other sadhana there's a wide today for example if you look at the internet or if you see any you know programs and such you'll see that there is a great amount of interest in spirituality indian spirituality hindu dharma various kinds of spirituality that is there um, which is very wonderful but the number of people who will reach high states is still the same it was exactly what it had been 2000 years ago all the way <laughs> exactly the number of that hasn't changed yeah that hasn't that has changed. changed nature is very strict quality control yeah. is absolutely perfect yeah. okay yeah. <laughs> so uh, given that situation sometimes what happens is that people feel inspired ki mujhe bahut you know i i need to do some fantastic amount of sadhana so they may try and bite off more than they can actually digest and then that energy generated from the sadhana can cause some disturbances this is possible this problem is preempted if there is a if there is a guide a guru or an upasak who can uh, see how does the guiding actually work even forget past life forget this that if you have to guide a person you have to know that person you have to know that person very clearly what is her his temperament tendency what is his or her nature so you observe them carefully you observe them when they are least expecting it okay in a in a very organic situation how do they behave in that manner is there is element of aggression is there is an element of sweetness what kind of personality is there Uh, you know an element of uh, courage is there an element of uh, uh, when there is a confrontation situation the person may run away etc small things you understand the person's basic personality and then you understand that what practice is suitable what date is suitable how far you or she may go this so uh, two things if somebody is really keen that they want to progress then you cannot give up that and they will not give up any man i have seen that you not get resolved still they'll carry on and then there are some who are not meant to progress they may have initially started with a lot of josh and then uh, 
you know, they'll fall off the bar. All of people will fall off the wagon if they are not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that helps. So in a way, it's like you would say that yeah. people who start off with a determination that I really need to get this done and I want to pursue, they will pursue. And the ones who are just like, oh, let me just give it a try because it's a mm-hmm. fashion statement these days. Like you yes, know, like yes, spirituality yes. is like a. It's, it's more in fashion. Everybody is talking about it. Mm. So let me just also jump on mm. it, and that will fall off. Um, mm. And at the end of the day, like you mm. said, something very beautifully that is the honesty, you know, which is like the mm. complete and utter honesty about who you mm. are, what you are. Mm. And here comes a bigger bottleneck because most people are so mm. less self-aware of who yeah. they are, what they are. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Which is why this level of honesty, when it comes to it, becomes very diluted because you know you're mm-hmm. you're expecting too much uh, because mm-hmm. you you yourself are not aware of you know who you are but, and what you are. Mm-hmm. Um, so, mm-hmm. what kind of things can these people do to even uh, upgrade the self awareness? Oh, that is so the easiest and the toughest thing. You first. <laughs> As I said, first principle in any sadhana is you have to be brutally honest with yourself, and uh, that's the one thing that is severely lacking in large number of people. Brutal honesty at every state, every state, because um, the ego likes to believe that you are capable. The ego likes to believe that you are somebody great. It's the natural tendency of the. Ego. And I've seen so many people. I mean, endless amount of people having very delusional, fanciful ideas about themselves. And uh, you will find not only that the very interesting thing is that you will soon get a a group of shared delusionists, which is very fantastic. So basically, yeah. I scratch your back, you scratch my back. Then we are all great. You are great. I am great. So we must be both great. So that type of very beautiful setup. You know, you gather that kind of a group, and you can all be happily deluded. And so, bottom line of all this is that you have to ask yourself very clearly: so why are you here? Why are you in this path in the first place? What is it that you really, really want? If that is clear, then everything will. That central idea theme is clear in your head, in your in your inner being. If that theme is clear, then that itself will guide you in the right way. You will know where to go, whom to hang out with, whom to leave, when to leave, what to do, etc. It will reorganize your life in the right way. Number one, number two is that given the age we are living in. You will always, somewhere or the other, have to give up things that you believe were correct. Nobody who is actually going to progress can say that right from day one. What I have learned, everything is absolutely, absolute perfect knowledge, and I am not going to give up anything. That means you are perhaps not progressing. You are still in class one. Yeah, deluded with a stamp. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this. Uh, This honesty has to be there in the first place. In the sense, you have to ask yourself that what is it that you want? And mind you, this is the best part. This thing is there can be no intermediary. No guru in the world can teach you this. And I have seen very fantastic, highly elevated tantric gurus and other gurus. They are all impressive. Nobody in the world can teach you this honesty. Either you have it or you don't have it. If you don't have it, nature will happily keep deluding you. You will remain in that small circuit of yours. Uh, with a group of you can gather a group of you know shared delusionists and you can feel happy about it, and then there may be somebody who actually asks this question. No, I really want to progress. No, and wanting to progress does not mean ten people coming and saying, "Oh, you are such a fantastic person." That gives a great kick to people. Okay, this idea that I am somebody fantastic, and I have seen that so many times. You know. It's it's like a, after it's like can you do your, do you phrase, know how many followers I have? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so I have seen that way too many times. You know, you gather a group of your own sort of uh, as I say, you praise me, I praise you kind of group, and then and then you do all your you can sing your own bhajans to each other, and then at the end you can always add a caveat. Actually, we are not. This is not to you know uh, self praise. We are just teaching people. Actually, it's like those. Caveats in the cigarette packs you have. No smoking is injurious to health, but you still get them. You can buy them. So that kind of stuff. So bottom line of that is that how honest are you about what you really want? If you want progress in spirituality, it has got nothing to do with fame. Fame and progress has got no links at all. It has got nothing to do with any material success. Fame and uh, 
spirituality and materialist material success are not on the same page all the time okay you may have one you may not have one so it's not at all linked to each other uh, so these kind of things it, it it is not even a a community building measure that is another funny thing i've seen people because they have sort of you know kuch nahi ho raha life mein so i join some organization and i feel happy and we can we go together and we sing and we uh, we feel collectively happy that's very good but that's not the real thing so it's not your path oh, in the whole work is yes. very different yeah yes so bottom line comes to this that you have to be brutally honest if you really want to progress you have to ask yourself that how 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 desperate am i to achieve this what am i ready to give up for this and you should be ready to give up everything everything means everything you only that individual who is ready to destroy his whole life If throw it up in the air and then, then and then throw it yeah. up in the air <laughs> yeah and then see what comes down and that's good <laughs> so we are back <laughs> we are back with the with the with the statement of like throw your life up in the air and yes. let's see you know if that's the kind of yes. dedication and surrender yeah. you probably mm. um and to start off another thing i wanted to touch a little bit in depth about the mantras So yes. you mentioned the hundred and eight, you know, mantras which you can chant of the deity. You know, when you right. when you don't have a guru or you're just starting off and you're mm-hmm. new in this mm-hmm. practice, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. uh, you have tons of things to do in mm-hmm. the material world, mm-hmm. but you just find this time right, to right. start off. Now there are also the other mantras which are like the beej mantra, which are yeah. you know uh, the most simplest of the mantras. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. so, what significance? So now there is one significance is when you chant the mantra it mm. is like you're chanting your inner something is happening inside of you. Mm. And then there is so much of noise on the outside you know so mm. much of all kinds of noises on the outside. Mm. So how do you train your inner sound of that mantra to hold the energy that is coming from the mantra to actually mm. resonate with something on the outside so that you're able to strike that balance. Uh what what would you need to do uh how this balance comes about how the mantra gets activated actually awakened and activated there is no set formula for this so that is why the key idea that was given was that you keep repeating them and large number of times so it's like you will see the text of mantra shastra they will tell you that you should do the mantras lakhs of times okay different mantras of different forms so by and large what happens is that if you follow the process process means suppose you want a mantra to get activated so there are you have to understand this thing that while there are innumerable mantras uh, the activation of a mantra the concept of activation of a mantra uh, has to be clearly understood what exactly does it cause what does it entail so it is not again i am primarily speaking from the tantric perspective in here chanting a mantra does not mean that i am chanting and going into a state of samadhi which means that the whole world is cut off only the sound of the mantra is vibrating in my head no that is not the way in which tantric mantras are chanted or preferred to be chanted that is the way if you are following perhaps perhaps a path related to dhyana or a path related to raj yoga and things like that okay where meditative quality is more important yeah. and for that meditation your key aim is that you have to reduce the disturbances from outside and focus internally that's a that's a path valid for the tantric mantra sadhana and that is where the vija mantras come in vija mantras are all tantric mantra the goal is slightly different here you are at no point going to lose awareness of the world that is not going to work that is not the path you are not to lose awareness of the world in fact you are only going to define your awareness of you are seeing the same reality around you but suddenly you are more aware of the reality smaller things that were unnoticed before suddenly become prominent and they will teach you some things and something is happening the canvas is the same the painting is the same suddenly your nature of appreciation of the reality changes so at no point are you cutting off from the reality that is not the path of the disciple that is not the way of tantric properly if you do it in the traditional way that is not you can meditate no problem after you do the mantra sadhana that's why we are told that if you are doing mantra japa you finish the japa first say you have to do 1000 malas of the mantra finish it after finishing you want to meditate you separate the meditation from the mantra sadhana do not add meditation mantra sadhana together then you will enter into some other path other track 
That is not the goal of the power. So how does the mantra really work? Suppose you a mantra needs to be needed to be chanted, uh, say one lakh times. One lakh is by and large a standard uh, number. I'm saying there could be numbers more. So you start the mantra with a sankalpa. Sankalpa means you make a promise that I am so and so individual on such and such date and such and such tithi etc. Deshkal patra you define and then say that X Y Z mantra I am going to chant for X, say one lakh number of times over a period of twenty days or ten days or forty days depends on the mantra and all that. And for the happiness of the devata, devata pratyartham, whoever is the deity of the mantra. So here in the tantra sadhana. It is very important to understand that the mantra and the devata are non-different. The mantra is the devata. Okay, the mantra is like the subtle body of the devata. The gross body of the devata is the vidra, is the mukti you are making. Subtle body of the devata is the mantra, and the mantra is more powerful than the gross body. Okay, so mantras are like each mantra uh, is like a very elevated spiritual being who lives in a plane, very high order plane, which in the scheme of, th- um, you know, in, in Kashmiri Shaivism, they had 36 tattvas, uh, realms of reality, on which there is a very high realm called the Shuddha Vidya, you know, the pure realms. So, mantras are like these high beings who survive in this very pure realm, which where uh, these mantras came out from the mouth of Lord Shiva, seven crore of them came out, and they were assigned the task of guiding appropriate individuals who serve them. How do you serve the mantra? By repeating the mantra many number of times. Okay. So, there is a way in which the consciousness inside the mantra can guide an individual and serve the individual in order to activate that process. So, this is where the technicality comes in of Tantra Sadhana. So, you do say one lakh japa of the mantra first and you do it with a sankalpa that you take make a promise. Sankalpa is very important. Without sankalpa, it will have no effect. Same one lakh japa you can do. You may have experiences by the way. You can have some experience. But it is not going to be an experience that will be fruitful. That's a big difference. Okay, An experience that uh, you can harmonize, integrate with yourself and then use it and apply it is very different from some random experience. I'm going on the road and there's a beautiful sunset. That's very good. But what's the other thing? That it. So, Tantra is always interested in power. Shakti is power. Power yeah. makes. Power runs this universe. Power makes power this runs, universe. Yeah. The and, and universe is, it, is it power. Is, it, is, it is power. It is, the, it is the exact same power with which this entire cosmos, you know, the, the yes. cosmos runs. And it's the same power that we have. We are manifestations of that yes. anyway. So, we, have, we hold that power. So, that itself, the practice itself makes a person very, mm. very powerful. Yes. Now, now here comes a difficult journey. Once mm. you are extremely, once you have the power, once you have the knowledge and you mm. have gathered it, you know, over the mm. years, mm. does your responsibility, does your, you know, being um, in the material world, your duties, mm. do they change? And if they change, how do they change? And what position then do you occupy? Because here you are a part of the cosmic you know, universe, mm. running, walking, talking, doing all the things mm. that, you know, mm. that you do. And, but you hold the knowledge. Now you mm. are a knowledge keeper. So mm. then automatically, does your responsibility become that of a teacher? Do you have to impart the knowledge as a, tan- as a tantra sadhak? What do no. you have to do? There is no set rule for this. See, here is the thing. You go very high. You may have certain abilities and you may develop certain with has certain knowledge, but there is always going to be somebody higher than you. Okay, this is how the this is how the structure of power is not the world runs on power. The whole world is shakti, and there is a difference in shakti of every individual. No, not everybody is equal. Nobody is equal. Everybody is different. That is the first basic principle. So you may be very high. There will be somebody higher than you. There is somebody higher than that higher person. Okay, this is how the structure is has been, is now, and will always be. So, in that case, the easiest thing to do is that if you are adhering to a very high state, at the same time, uh, linking back to the previous discussion we had on bhakti, you develop a tremendous amount of faith, bhakti and devotion, to either, if you have a very elevated guru, 
in the physical plane, suppose, or even better, if there is a deity. You leave it to the discretion of the deity to decide what exactly is to be done. It is not your job to figure out. You will never be able to yeah. figure out with the rational mind. Some people, it may be the job to teach. Some people, it may be to do nothing. Sit quietly yeah. and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Best job ever. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I was getting at that. I just felt that maybe at some point, you know, imagine you're just getting a chart at the end of it. Here yeah. you go. Now this is your job. And I was like, oh my God, is that what's coming? Because I always thought it doesn't work that way. But what if, you know? <laughs> might be a revelation so, so that's, that's uh, how... very nice to know that it, it is it is not, not nothing nothing set in stone and it just nothing uh, set in stone yes right it's nothing is set in stone and uh tell me when the in the tantra sadhana how many mm. how many years have you been in this practice in in tantra in tantra itself uh i have been in spiritual practice for uh 2000, uh, I think the first mantra I ever chanted was in 2006. Okay. That was the first time in between past two various things, which are, to put it in a, um, <laughs> to put it in a very mild manner, it is like, let's say that I had a lot of learning experiences. Okay. Mm. So, yeah. huh? so uh, each experience makes you wiser and I'm yes. so grateful to nature for putting me through so fantastic yeah. kind of people who have taught me how not to become spiritual, which is something nobody teaches you, by the way. Mm. Yeah. So those things were very helpful all the way. Uh, so, but yeah, I've been, 2006 was the first time I ever chanted a mantra. And before that, I had no reason to do that. I, I met somebody and I found uh, that individual very inspiring and I got curious. He, how is this possible? So that's when he gave me a mantra to chant. And I did it for a year and had some nice experiences right at the beginning itself. So that way. That's interesting. And now I think we're already close to an hour. I know you, you're joining us all the way from Kamakha, so I wouldn't want to keep you, uh, you know, for long. But there is this question that I have to ask, which is a question that most people, mm -hmm. Tantra, the word itself, scares mm -hmm. a lot of people. You know, right. it, it is, it is off-putting. Mm -hmm. In a way, it is like, oh, Tantra. Oh, no, no, no. Tantra is like, it's very scary connotation mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Now, my question to you is, why is it so scary? Why is the, you know, perception so scary about Tantra? And uh, there is nothing to be scared of. But why is it so scary? Oh, that's because it is kind of heterodox in respect. So, so there is the mainstream system of Pasana, there is the Vedic and the Puranic system of Pasana, and then there is the Tantric system of Pasana, which is quite, uh, to, to the person who follows the mainstream Vedic Paddhati of Pasana, to him or her, the tantric system may appear completely uh, divine, to put it another way. So, uh, to give you a simple example, one of the things that tantra sadhana requires at the higher stages, after you have a Bhunavishik Diksha, so there are tremors of Diksha in tantra sadhana. Okay? Each Diksha gives you a level of Adhikara to do a practice. So, again, as I said, the world is filled with Shakti, but no two individual has the same amount of Shakti. So, in order to make sense of this, Tantra decides that there are Kramas, stages of Diksha, of Adhikara. So, someone starts off as, at the level of, first you have an Upadesh, then you have a Shakta Vishak Diksha, then you have a Purna Vishak Diksha, things like that. Go ahead. So, after somebody passes the stage of a Purna Vishak Diksha, he or she, uh, if they are in the Kola mark, Tantra has various marks, so he or she is allowed to use five very heterodox elements in the Upasana of the deities, things that are completely, um, uh, things that have a negative connotation and would never be associated with mainstream worship in the, uh, you know, the Vedic, uh, the uh, Vedic Dharma, for example. So you offer to the deity meat, you offer to the deity fish, you offer to the deity alcohol, you offer to the deity mudra, and you offer to the deity maithuna, which is ritualized sex. All these things, are, by the way, offered in a certain pattern and a manner. It is not random. It is not, and that is where, that is where the problem is, because quite often there are people who find all this very titillating and they may, you know, enter into the path of Tantra, but without the necessary preparation, without the Adhikara to go ahead, and in the Kulandava Tantra, Lord Shiva mentions this very fantastic thing, that somebody who enters into this path without the Adhikara, Adhikara means basically Adhikara, Adhikara is the right to do this. You attain the right to practice. First, you do the primary steps. You practice for years and years and years. In fact, tantras tell you not only years, 
you practice for lifetimes. Lifetimes, yeah. Yes. Then you attain to that energy level, and mm-hmm. once you attain to that energy level, then you attain to this level of worship when you do these practices. Okay, and they are not these practices. Which uh, in the mainstream understanding is, you know, uh, th- there's a risk involved in this practice. There's no, I'm not denying that. There's a reason reason why the mainstream practices stay away from this, and because for the ordinary person, it is best not to indulge in these practices. But once your energy level has gone to that condition, and your connection to the devata has been formed, uh, these practices then work very fast, and they produce tremendous results. But only when it is done in the right karma, in the right adhikara. Adhikara means again, as I say, you know, only who has the right to do this. That individual does it. So, uh, therefore, what happens is that when, from the mainstream perspective, this is looked at, so it is too jarring. I mean, even in India, 90% of the people would be shocked out of the senses um, if you tell them that these five uh, are offerings that can be given to Makali, that can be given to Matara, any of the Tantric Mahavidyas. Huh? Just two days ago, I was. Uh, there was a ritual that was going on and it was a couple of, two, three days ago, I see. So, uh, in the Vedic Paddhati, you do Achman. Uh, before you start a practice, you take the name of Vishnu. You take some water and you sip the water thrice with the name of Vishnu. Uh, in this specific ritual that I was part of, even the Achman was done with alcohol, ritualized alcohol. So, this is very fascinating. So, you are purifying yourself with alcohol. You are giving... Offerings of Tarpana. Tarpana means basically oblations that we give to ancestors and devatas and all that. In the Vedic system, all this is being done using water, simple Ganga, Jal, this, that, etc. Here, we are using uh, ritualized alcohol, ritually consecrated alcohol. So, not just, you know, just buy something and start off. There's a process, you remove certain, use certain mantras to purify that. And then it becomes an elixir. And then you do various things with it. You offer it to the gods. You give the best of the things to the gods. But yes, this is where the ritualism is important. You know, there are two ways in which people react to this. One is that with complete shock and abhorrence, that this is all divine, that this is all nonsense, and therefore tantra is very scary kind of thing. And the other, who are actually the non-practitioner, non-practitioner, but they think that okay, this gives me a license to indulge in things that I anyway do. So yeah. I go pop up, so I mean, as well use some alcohol, do that. No, that is completely different. You. You cannot skip the ritual part and directly go into this. The rituals are designed so that it creates your energy level to that state where when you do this offering, it brings a very positive result. It brings a very positive interaction with the deity. Uh, so, this is, I believe, one of the primary reasons why Tantra has had a negative connotation. Uh, but if understood correctly and practiced by the right individual, it is the most fascinating of all parts. I mean, uh, not because I follow this, but obviously I have some bias towards it. There's no path as beautiful as Tantra. There's no path as beautiful as as fascinating as Tantra. Agree. I completely agree. I like it for the you know little nuances that the path has, especially with mm. the you know very precise you know ways. And I think my brain works like that. It's two plus mm-hmm. two is four. I want to see the result. <laughs> you know. Exactly. <laughs> so. so I, I, I it 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 uh, kind of you know speaks to my soul in that way. Um, and now coming to it, like all through we say like we are expecting the result, we are working for the result. Now, what is the result? You know, what is the result that, that Sadhaks like you are working on? Oh, so mm, that result is, uh, Tantra allows you to have a wide range of results. What is it that you want? You decide for yourself. You want a liberation. Just today I was reading the Kamakya Tantra. There's a very beautiful description where Shiva and Parvati are speaking and the goddess is asking that what is liberation and he says that liberation means unbroken connection to Parashakti. Unbroken conscious connection to Parashakti. It is not that, okay, I today I now need to find out, you know, I need to contact the goddess or the deity I'm worshipping, whoever it is. So I sit for 10 hours of meditation and I do a lot of tamjam, etc. For after all that effort, one second I'll feel connected to the divine and that's so beautiful. That is how sadhana is finally for every one of us when we are starting. So Shiva is saying that when that state becomes continuous, you are all the time connected to the deity. And it is the deity who is the liberation. There is nothing else. There is nothing nothing beyond. There is no, no other thing that is mukti. There is no other thing that is uh, liberation. When the connection to the devata, to the parashakti is unbroken, continuous with the sadhana, 
he is already liberated okay because then it is not his mind it's working the whole perspective changes whole there is no stress in life there is no the the six chains that bind the consciousness are broken down uh, six chains eight parshas sorry ashta parshas the eight chains that bind the consciousness are broken down so that is the uh, idea of liberation that uh, you know uh, one can work towards and that is why it's beautiful because uh, at the end of the day all practices are finally aimed at transcending the human condition because human condition there's nothing great about the human condition that is why we need you know <laughs> human condition is not great we don't need to go to religion i mean remove laws for 10 days everything breaks up into chaos so humans do not have the ability to regulate themselves they never had not today not tomorrow so you will need external imposition whether it is you need to have a secular set of laws so there are criminal laws and this and laws for the state or you have a set of religious laws either process is that you need something external to govern and control the human beings humans by themselves are incapable of uh, you know living in a very advanced and highly harmonious condition It's just not there in our dna so in that case therefore the whole aim of sadhana is that you transcend the human condition you become divine you will be in this body you will be in this life but you become like a god living in man that is a very high condition or if you go the vedantic path then you you know end up into brahman and all that story happens hmm. now uh, tantra gives you the liberty to have lesser goals in that and there is no harm in it no it is not like i want to worship i i have no desires and i only want mukti and all that that story is very good but the world is not convinced because everybody has desires okay i have not seen a single person who has no desires in fact people who keep harping that i have no desires are the ones with the maximum amount of desires a couple yeah. of itself like a big list they have a big list which they don't want to yes. share with the world <laughs> coupled with a lot of self delusion internally oh i i am so good i don't have desires all nonsense full nonsense okay so tantra recognizes this human condition and which is very which is just normal and it says okay so you want a good job you want uh, you have you have trouble from enemies uh, you have a monetary problem you have this problem that problem so all these problems at the fundamental nature there is an interaction of play of some forces and shaktis that are working so do this ritual you get this result you do this ritual you get this result. it's very clear if you want a materialistic result result you do that kind of a uh, person of a deity and uh, there's a chances if uh, you know if the result is the ritual is correctly done and you have the capacity you will get some positive result so there is wide range of material um applications of shakti you see this is what i was going at, getting at at that point because the world is shakti and to recognizes that shakti means power so you are not to live like a doormat no no your your role is not that okay koi bhi kuch bhi ho jaye somebody walks over you and all that it is all god's blessing no that is not your role at all in the tantric path in the shakta upasana you are not to live like a doormat you are only allegiance only doormat you become when the goddess is there for everybody else you have to be in your own fixed uh, individuality and believe and treat the world in the way it needs to be treated okay so you have to acquire the power and you have to apply the power the moment i need and all the time we are doing this forget tantra i have a job i haven't gotten promotion in so many years so i'm looking for a new job what am i exactly doing i there's a desire i'm trying to fulfill that desire all the time working towards it and i'm using certain forces which is a force i'm i'm giving an interview i'm learning some new knowledge okay i'm developing my skill sets i'm giving this is all play of shakti along with that tantra says that add, let's add a few mantras to this whole process you do whatever give 10 15 interviews all good so <laughs> along with that add a little just bit of add, just yes, add a bit of spice like to, to it, it spice <laughs> yeah. it okay. yeah. it'll just make it fantastic yeah, yeah. open up for the taste good and open the exactly. opportunities for you yeah 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 precisely i think i think i think that is that is what that is exactly what the spirituality is all about the paths are all mm. to do is to help you mm. you know you're not supposed exactly. to live like a mm. beggar and a you know exactly. poor mm. and starve mm. and you're not mm. supposed to do any of that because if mm. people feel that is what they are supposed to do mm. there is a problem mm. because that's not yeah. how it's uh, mm. how it's meant to be uh, so mm. thank you for sharing that and sharing that this openly so that you know most people who have this question they can go over it <laughs> um and and also the fact that a lot of people feel that not doing anything is also a you know oh yes fun. yes yeah. not doing anything is also a kind of doing something mm. yeah yeah and and that is that is also like a lot of people who feel that you know we are not it, it's fine mm. i'm taken care of you know mm. but there is a lot of work 
do you mm. feel that not doing like not even making that effort is going to lead to anything it it probably doesn't what do you think so that to depend on the context i can't make a you know i don't have a Judge, general statement yes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i'm not going to put you on spot to make a general statement <laughs> like even in in spirituality let's say within spirit within the spiritual mm. path in mm. tantra for example uh, mm. not doing anything is that an option like if i'm on the path and i want mm. to really acquire the power and i want to get the taste of that power you know mm. Uh, mm. Uh, even just like even even as a non believer say for example i'm a non believer i don't believe mm. in it but mm. i just want to feel it for the heck mm. of it you know just mm. to see how it if it really works you know those guys like testing it um and i start and um if i don't do anything will i still get a result no no, no. absolutely not uh or get, there has to be something to connect you to that no without doing anything you will not get result that's why the rituals are so important that's why the stress is given that even if you don't get the results you continue with the rituals so even mantra japa is a ritual it's a karma kanda mm. uh when you are sitting and doing something some practice that is still a ritual there is some element of ritual that is important so ritual means something to practice something to do actually some sadhana to do so you have to do uh, without doing anything you will never get that's the question does not arise in the first place so action is absolutely important positive directed clear goal oriented action not just some random thing here and there so, you know five one day this and another day another thing that will not be there so you have to have a very clear goal oriented action towards your goal for which you need to first have the clarity of what exactly you want and mm, do this work yeah they i mean i have no doubt about it uh, but on the other hand if somebody asks me do how do i convince somebody well, i at the stage where i have stopped convincing anybody yeah. <laughs> whoever wants to <laughs> don't have to whoever wants to come come yeah. whoever does yeah, want yeah, to come absolutely. don't come it's yes. yeah that's our policy that's my policy to whatever <laughs> comes comes whatever doesn't come mm, doesn't exactly. come up not bother to you know follow mm. it or literally True. uh you know mm. trying to convince people that no you should exactly. do this because everybody mm. has a different story and you know right, it's right. Uh, Mm. and i feel through my experience mm. and even with interacting with you it's like you know sometimes people just connect if they mm. have to connect and there Correct. is no like mm. rule to Absolutely. it and it just mm. happens mm. um so any last thoughts before i let you go uh nothing specifically uh i don't know any other last thoughts uh, but uh, perhaps uh, this is uh, just a two lines on this peter kamakya is the greatest of all tantric pitas when uh, it is historically close to more than 2000 years old and we find from the texts that uh, there are you know originally there were four pitas that used to be mentioned shakti pitas uh, three of them are lost to us today we don't even know where they are because of various changes in time and things like that uh, but kamakya is one of the original four shakti pitas which is still prevalent and uh, it is one of those temples in india where the pasana paddhati is entirely tantrukta the vedic process is not followed here so bali is a very important part of the ritual here uh, alcohol offerings are made to the mother with special again nothing of this is random if you see a typical priest here doing a performing a ritual yeah. you'll be amazed at the number of mudras even do just you know sitting with the ingredients and whatever things that is to be offered all this forms a beautiful symphony there is mudras there are mantras there are asanas all this together yeah, it creates the right energy and then you bring the offering to the deity so kamakya is a mahavita it has always been and it will always remain so and it's more like an iceberg what you get to see on the top is perhaps just a fraction of the total amount of oh, the power capacity that this bit has it's matchless and I remember you had have- I literally recommended that we go and visit this. I know you yes. said that it's on yes. my list, and I have yes. not made it yet. But thank you for coming for a session <laughs> right from the heart. Uh, you know, which which means a lot to me and to Dhi and to all of us. Um, but yeah, it's on one my you know, so it's on my list. I really have to. It's like mm. I have to be you there sure? and have to mm. yeah to come in there. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That thank was you. good. I'm going to stop I'm the recording now. Because the shop edit for the idea. I just said the idea of you coming in from Kamakha. Kamakha. Kamakha.